Mm -hmm. I call the Greenview Board of Education meeting to order for November 17th, 2022. Call the roll. Mrs. Arthur? Here. Mr. Powers? Present. Mrs. Smith? Here. Mrs. Wallace? Here. And Mrs. Reagan? Here. Pledge of allegiance. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any public participation on the agenda items only at this time? All right, I have a motion to approve the agenda. Oh, I'll second. Mrs. Arthur? Yes. Mr. Powers? Yeah. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Wallace? Yes. Mrs. Reagan? Yes. Motion passes. All right. At this time, we have a special ed presentation. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome, Mr. George. Thank you so much. Um, and we do have a PowerPoint. If we can, get there. Yeah. Mr. Davis, do I need to do anything special to get us you rolling? Need, you need me to get you rolling. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, we I'm we getting go. there. Actions. <laughs> All right. Now, if I have this right, I go forward and backwards on here, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for giving us the opportunity to come here and um, speak. I. I I had the opportunity to come and present to you guys last year um, to talk about how we've made a full um, transition to inclusion and co-teaching in our middle and high schools. Um, this year, I really wanted to talk about the other side of the coin that enabled us to make that transition. And that is how we've, we've developed and strengthened our resource programming in the middle and high school buildings. Um, when we were starting the conversation about how to improve services to special education students, um, we, we took a really close look at what we were doing at the time, and the resource program was housing all of our students at once. Um, if you were identified as a student with a disability, you would receive your instruction in a separate setting classroom um, based on that content area. And moving away from that, we knew that we needed to create a space that would allow for our students with the most significant disabilities to also thrive. That wouldn't be a general education classroom. And so that's what I want to talk to you guys about tonight. And really, my part of this is extremely minimal. I, I am not the one that's going to talk to you about everything that we're doing. We're, I'm thankful that Mr. Trent Olds and Mrs. Regina Heim have joined me this this evening to uh, come speak to the, the amazing work that they're doing in these buildings. And uh, no, you know, not to forget Mrs. Arthur either. I'll let Mr. Olds do all the introductions, but um, I just wanna, again, say thank you for, for the time. Um, these are people doing really important work in our buildings and I wanted to give them the opportunity to stand in front of you guys and show off for lack of a better sense, how good and how amazing it's been for them. So. Let's start with um, my little bit here. So what is a resource classroom? A resource classroom is a separate setting classroom where spe a special education programs delivered to students identified with disabilities, either individually or in a small group. Um, they can look different in every building that you go into um, because the students that populate these, these classrooms are different and unique and individual. So our approach to educating them needs to be unique and individualized. Um, why is it essential for what we're doing? Um, I, I kind of referenced that already. Um, when we wanted to push our, our um, higher cognitively functioning special education students into those general education environments, we knew that we had a population in our schools that would not be, that would not succeed in those environments. So in order for us to make that sort of a transition, we needed to create the space that allows for these students to thrive as well. That said, I'm going to let now pass this off to Mrs. Hahn, who's going to talk about the work that she's doing 
at the middle school. And you're gonna get to see some of the faces that populate that classroom here. So Mrs. Hahn, you just press that as you go through okay. and we'll be right here with you for anything right. you need, okay? All right. Good Hello. evening. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Regina Heim. I am the intervention specialist at the middle school. I believe this is about my eighth year at Greenview. Um, this is my fourth year in this classroom. Um, I was both nervous and excited to start this. Uh, my background is in the multi-handicap classrooms. Um, so I was excited to go back to my, my roots to say. Uh, these are my wonderful students. Um, and uh, one of my aides, uh, the other aide is now an art teacher, but um, I've had a lot of issues with attendance this year, so I didn't have a group picture. <laughs> But these are my lovelies. <laughs> okay, so what were our goals when we started? Um, it was to help the students who were on alternate assessment. These were the students who didn't participate in the general state testing. Um, so, you know, they took the alternate assessments. And so this allowed us to go to... Um, expand the opportunities for those individuals. You know, we were in a smaller group setting um, than even the typical resource rooms that they were in. Uh, they were allowed to get all of their instruction for core classes in that small group setting because prior to the start of my classroom, they were getting English or language arts and math in the resource setting. But we're going into the general ed classroom um, at the middle school level for science and social studies. So, you know, they were trying to keep up with the gen ed students in the general ed curriculum. Um, and some of them, with a lot of modifications, could be successful. But if they didn't get the right modifications, it was a struggle. And, you know, it was very, you know, some of the students knew that they were different and knew that they couldn't do the work. And so it just really, it was real difficult for them. So that allowed us to, you know, give more individualized instruction um, down to their level um, and use the extended standards instead of the regular standards. And with using the extended standards, we were able to purchase programs that focused on those extended standards. Um, right now, I use a program called Unique, which helps set up the English, the math, <laughs> science, social studies. And this program focuses on those extended standards. So I am meeting their standards for their grade level. They are being taught grade level standards, but at their level, instead of trying to take, you know, the a seventh grade standard and figure out how to teach it for a student who reads at a primer or even first grade level, this program allows me to teach that to them. Um, this also allows me to focus on vocational and daily living skills. Um, as these students come to me from the elementary, because they're in the general education classrooms, they're lacking on some vocational and daily living skills, um, time, money. Um, I have students come that can't tell me how many days in a week, how many months in a year. So this allows me to work on information that will give, you know, let them improve their life skills, um, work towards becoming employable. Now, you know, granted at the middle school, I definitely don't get to have as much fun as Trent does, <laughs> but you know we can work on money, time, the social, social and emotional part. We do get to do a little bit of cooking. Um, I always love Black Friday coals because you can find the really cheap stuff. So we have some uh, like griddles, uh, an electric skillet. My mom gave me. My mom gave me her toaster oven. So, you know, we, we get some things done. Um, don't have the great big kitchen or anything, but I dream one day, hint, hint. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm a dreamer. Um, and also it allows me to focus on some vocational skills. It could be sweeping the floor, uh, shredding paper, because um, there are some programs that that's what 
students with very low cognitive skills, that may be a job for them to actually just shred paper. Um, cleaning, cleaning tables, delivering mail. Um, I do, and I have a picture in here of one student who is able to actually put the paper in the copiers. Teachers love that. Nothing more frustrating than going to make copies and it's empty. So, you know, we do things like that. Um, so the history behind my classroom, I try to talk quick, but I, I'm kind of long-winded sometimes. Um, my first year was the 2019-2020 school year. I actually had nine students. I was excited. Um, I, th I think all of them were new to me. I didn't have any students that I'd had in the past because at that point I had done eighth grade. So the students I had had all gone to the high school. So I had uh, three fifth graders, two sixth graders, one seventh grader, and three eighth graders. So I was really excited and no idea what I was going to do. <laughs> but we were making it through and it was really being productive. I had students who were not very successful in the building the year before who were making great strides. Um, they had behaviors, the behaviors were stopping. And I think it's because they were being taught at their level. I think they finally felt that somebody cared and was helping them, you know, they weren't, they didn't hit that brick wall. They weren't frustrated. So that was, you know, made me feel really great that, you know, maybe these kids for once felt like they were actually, you know, um, learning. And I know that sounds silly, kids could care less, but I think they appreciated the fact that they were learning. Then COVID hits. I was really bummed because we were making huge strides, um, especially with some of the programs we've had. Um, I saw non-readers start to read. Um, it was amazing. I mean, it was just amazing. When you see the light bulb, best moment. I mean, I can't even tell you how it feels. But because we had my classroom, the next year when we went hybrid, uh, where kids could either go, um, I lost the word, <coughs> remote, it, where they could either you know go virtual or come to school, it opened the opportunity for the kids who were on alternate assessment to have somebody that could service their needs. I was able to prepare their lessons because they weren't able to do the online stuff. So then for the whole year, while they were out doing virtual work, it was my virtual work instead of trying to do what the, the ESC, is that who it went through? Mm -hmm. Do what the ESC was having the other kids do. So it let them be successful, even though they were doing their schooling from home. So that was a nice um, advantage too. Okay, here's the advantages of my classroom in my mind. <laughs> We were able to modify the instruction to meet students' needs and to cater to their strengths and interests. My schedule, um, if you look at a uh, master schedule, says TBD. <laughs> I love it. I get to make the schedule. I get to determine what we do when, um, which is great because then I can find what the kids like, what they're interested in, and I can spend more time as needed. Extended time allows for understanding and mastery. If something takes a little longer, I have the ability to take that extra time. If they get it quicker, I can shorten it. Um, the freedom to develop a daily schedule that matches their present levels of functioning. If we need more math, less social studies, I can do that. Um, Opportunities to provide instruction and coaching on life skills in the classroom. You know, every day is a teaching day. Um, like today, for example, I had a student didn't have a good day, um, but we were able to talk through it and let him know, hey, bad day today, but it's okay, tomorrow's a new day. But we're, you know, out in a regular classroom, it would have been a discipline, you know, a disciplinary action. But in my room, we were able to solve it and, you know, work towards a better day the next day. You know, I mean, there's consequences in my room. Don't get me wrong. It's not, 
you know, free for all in there, but we deal with it more in house, you know, so there's, there's real consequences because I'm not a pushover, but they, it's more of a, you know, I call them my kids when they're there, they're mine. I tell their parents they have them back after school, but when they're there, they're mine. So we try to teach them, you know, all, you know, to cover every aspect of the daily life skills. Um, I think that's about it. And so I just, some adventures. Um, we were making mummy dogs. Um, we did the Oreo experiment um, doing moon phases. Um, we studied moon phases. And so then they had to scrape the icing to represent the moon phases. Did they get to eat them when they're done? They got to eat them. <laughs> <laughs> so this sure. is just, <laughs> just <clears throat> you know, this early in the year, I don't have as many pictures as I typically do. Um, over here, we did do a Chris uh, or a Halloween craft. Um, I try to mix it up. You know, sometimes we do crafts, uh, you know, just to work on the following directions. There's, you know, filling the copier. That's the one in the hallway. Um, obviously, that's a student. <laughs> you could do it right so it doesn't jam because I'm definitely not having anybody come hunt me down. <laughs> um, but these are, oh, that's all for me. <laughs> uh, before we transition to Mr. Mr. Old, I yes. would just like to say, as, as Mrs. Hyman was talking about the, the transition, you know, she was really the, the initiator for all of the work that we were able to start at the middle school. Um, so her transition from eighth grade intervention specialist to now our um, kind of self-contained resource teacher at the middle school was the first step in allowing us to take some major strides in the special education service delivery that we've done. And then when we did get to that COVID year, um, the, just the support and the close connection that those families were able to have, um, especially going into that next year. I mean, these were students who COVID was a real threat to them. Mm -hmm. um, these families were afraid to send their children to school for good reason. Um, and they were able to feel confident about the decisions that they were making because of that close relationship that we were able to, to offer them. Mm -hmm. They know that they have somebody who cares about their kids. And if you know anybody who has a child with a disability, a significant cognitive disability, there requires a level of trust in the things that we are doing in these buildings that I can't even imagine. Some of these children are nonverbal. Some of them, you know, so if you have a student that can't come back to you and let you know how their day went, you have to have nothing but faith in, in the, the services that are being provided to them when they leave you. And seeing what Mrs. Hines has been able to do and help us establish that relationship with these families has just been tremendous. So thank you, Regina, for everything. I appreciate that. So preface, Mr. Old, before he steps up here, um, we, we started the program at the middle school. Um, we were able to develop a proof of concept for how that worked. And then I was able to take that to Mr. Kasner and say, you know, we've, we have these students in your building. And right now we're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. You know, we need to create a square hole. <laughs> like that's our responsibility. And so that's when we had the opportunity to um, bring Mr. Olds on board. And with his background and experience and working with his populations, just taking the work at the high school and, and ran with it. So um, the pipeline goes exactly from Regina to Trent. Um, they use the same curriculum. They use the same programming. What Regina gets to start, Mr. Olds has the opportunity to take to the next level. So Trent, how, if you will. How does it work with the age differentiation, though? So like if you've got yeah. your fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, you've got all those kids together. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Are you just, I mean, is the teacher, are you just focusing on their individual skill set and teaching them? Essentially, so the, the bell curve is drastic, right? I mean, this is not a large classroom. You can see right. everybody that, that Mr. Olds has right there. Mm -hmm. You see in, in Mrs. Himes' pictures, you saw every student that was mm -hmm. there, right? Um, but the bell curve of ability mm -hmm. is massive. Right. And, and so when, when Regina was speaking to the, the unique learning systems curriculum that, that we've invested in and are utilizing in these classrooms, that's one of the things that makes that functional for us. So what, what the unique curriculum does is provide them with, with a monthly template of lessons that are all unified and, and um, connected. 
So this month, I would imagine next month is going to focus on holidays, right? Mm -hmm. That's, I don't know what else you would put in a December monthly <laughs> lesson. Um, what they do though, is they take that exact same content and they level it for us. So okay. if you have an, I, I forget what the, what the yeah. levels of differentiation yeah, are, but it's A to AA to all of that. And so every student sitting around this table could all be working on the same book but yours could look exactly different from Amy's, right? So you might have a full page text that's telling the story while Inga has pictures that she's working with, right? Okay. Or a picture on the page with one word mm -hmm. that she's working on as she's developing her skills. So investing in the right stuff mm -hmm. helps us move this forward too. Um, mm -hmm. And I think Mr. Olds can speak to that because as we, we leaned into the, the curriculum and um, we actually did training on it this week, <clears throat> To, to really take that to the next level. Um, Mr. Olds realized how much work he had been doing <laughs> in trying to create everything from scratch and take that as far as, it, as, as, far as he could. Um, so to offload some of that work into that program that we invested in allows them to look at these students as individuals rather than spend their entire time trying to build curriculum. That's great. So thank I you. hope that answers your Absolutely. question. Absolutely, thank you. So, and it's divided yeah. by grade bands. So yeah. like, you know, I have a, um, I think I use a, what, six, seven, eight grade mm -hmm. was what I had mm -hmm. because I had six, seven, and eighth grade. And he has a high school grade band. Okay. So it aligns those standards yeah. for those grade levels. Yeah. yeah Mr. Olds, what was yours? Uh, right. uh, first off, thanks for, uh, thanks for your time. Let us come and speak to you. Um, I, I think that Regina can attest to this that so you know we we have you know our crew we're in our classroom um we don't get out much um because we constantly spend so much time with our kids so it's it's nice to be able to get out um talk about the kids and talk about what we're doing with them um because this is a population that um if you don't keep your thumb on them um, can go off the wayside so um just I appreciate the time and letting us talk about these kids because um, they really are special. Um, they offer a lot of unique abilities and, uh, <clears throat> you know, the different strengths, um, different weaknesses that we try to, you know, harness and, and make them into strengths. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, I also want to thank uh, Mr. George for all of his, his himself as a resource and all of the resources he provides. Um, they're invaluable. Um, I don't know. Uh, last year, it was the first year for our program at the high school. It's my first year at Greenview. So not only was I getting to know a staff, I was also getting to know students and I was developing a curriculum um, as we were going. So last year was a long year. Um, <laughs> it wasn't a bad year by any, any it wasn't a bad year by any means. It was just very long. And uh, and if it wasn't for Mr. Mr. George, uh, I, I, it could have been, it could have felt a lot longer. Um, so, um, but year two, um, we kind of hit the ground running. Um, so this is the second year with our kids. Um, I want to thank Mr. Kasner for all the wisdom and thoughts um, that he shares, um, taking a vested interest in our kids, as well as Mr. Ty, who handles, you know, our assistant principal. And I, I also want to thank Beth Arthur. Uh, Beth back there came tonight. She's our full-time paraprofessional in the classroom. And She's absolutely phenomenal. Um, if you don't know Beth, um, you should. Um, <laughs> the things that she's capable of doing and the things that she's capable of getting out of students is, is amazing. Um, so we really got a good thing going. Um, and just we'll highlight some of the things as you go through the presentation. We'll tell you what we do, what we're about, what our focus is, and where we want these students to go. So, um, that's my crew. So our goal is to build a community of learners that focuses on real world skills. And we do that by providing coursework and, and real world experiences in the classroom and outside of the classroom to give them needed job skills that they can translate into a potential career. Um, our, so in a nutshell, our job, my job is to get these kids work ready. Uh, we want them to be able to graduate from Greenview High School and have the skills needed to be able to go work at a job. And um, would we like for them to be college bound? Absolutely. Um, some will be. Um, Tommy in the lower right hand corner, um, bound and determined to go to Ohio State and he will, and he'll be very successful. Um, whereas my other two, James, Michael right there, they wanna work. 
Um, both of them currently have jobs right now. Um, and so that's a huge focus of ours is getting these students out in the community, having them work and develop those skills. And in the classroom and with us for the seven hours of the day, it's to develop those skills and really make sure that they understand what they have to do in order to be a good, not only a good student, but a good member of society and being able to wake up every day and have the skills that they need in order to be able to go do a job and support themselves. So that a lot, academics is only a part of what we do. Um, so we'll dive into more of that. Um, our focus, okay, what's our focus in the classroom? It's to assist students in working towards an inviolable post-secondary life. Um, getting them to a position where they have the skills and the knowledge to be able to sustain a viable post-secondary life after they graduate from high school, where they can take care of themselves and even to a point where they can start a family and take care of a family. Um, so that is what we want from, from these kids. Yes, is it good for them to be able to solve an algebraic equation or to tell me what year um, the American Revolutionary War happened? Yes, but what's more important is that we make these students understand that being a functional member of society and being able to take care of themselves and take care of others and care for others is what we want from them, okay? If we want them to be able to sustain employment, and we do that by aligning all of our instructional tasks in the classroom to what their employment desires are. So um, with that said, the students have to take an active role in deciding what their future is gonna look like. We can't decide that for them, okay? We can only provide them benefits and guidance. Um, so once you get with me um, as an eighth grader, you've got to start thinking about what you want to do, because what we do in that classroom is tailored towards your, their interests. Mr. Rose, would you speak a little bit to the, the timeline that, that we've kind of established where we look at their transition to the career center? And then if that doesn't work for them, though, how we look at those sort of things? Absolutely. So um, what we do is. Um, and I'll hit the bullet points and I'll talk to you about where our kids transition to, because some of our kids that I have in my classroom, half of those kids might not be with me next year. So, and that's the way it is. And I'll explain, and I'll explain that timeline. And I'm glad Mr. George brought that up. Mm -hmm. So, but in order to, to decide a placement for our kids and where they need to go, we have to identify what skills they need and how to, and what we need to do to be able to assist them in developing those skills. And that only starts with building relationships with them and building relationships within the community so we can secure potential work-based learning opportunities for them. Um, and then we also wanna create opportunities that develop academic and job skills. And we want them to make sure that they're making progress towards their, their transitional goals. And so transitional goals. In our program, you come in as an eighth grader. You are undoubtedly gonna be with us for, with Ms. Arthur and I and Mrs. Bryant, um, our, she's our part-time paraprofessional in the classroom. They'll come with us, you're with us for eighth, ninth, and 10th grade. Once your 10th grade year ends, you need to start thinking about what you wanna do. We would love to be able to push kids to the career center. Okay, we have, I had two seniors last year and three students in my class that went to the career center. Three of those were sophomores that went as juniors and then a senior that graduated that went into career X. Um, so four of our students last year went to the career center. Um, so we had a rather large group last year, 13, 14 kids in our class. So when you're a 10th grader, you need to decide if you want to go to the career center and what you want to study. And then we will help them get in the career center. Also, when they turn 16, we try to find them a job out in the community. And we hook them up with services through Green County Developmental Disabilities and uh, uh, opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities. So I work in conjunction with a, a gentleman named Bill Penrod who will come in when the students are 16 years old and they'll do basically an intake with the family and they'll start looking for job placements for these students while they're in high school. And as of right now, we have four students in our class that have job placements that are working. One of our students just got hired at McDonald's two days ago. Um, so that's what we're working towards. If they don't want to go to the career center by the time they're a soft, by the time they're junior year, then the goal is to get them graduated at Greenview High School, and we want to push them in the direction um, with the help of Green County Board of Developmental Disabilities and all opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities, link them with connections, and we want to get them out into the world and working. And what they those organizations do is they help support 
um, independent living and making sure that they are transitioning um, things that us teachers can't help with outside of the classroom. That's what they help them with was transitioning to life when they graduate and have us as resources until they don't have anybody when they graduate. And that's where they pick up where we leave off. We also push kids if they don't want to go directly in the workforce by the time they graduate their 12th grade year, we push for them to go to a program called Career X, which is at the Career Center, which will take, which our seniors will defer their diploma and they will go to the Career Center, be placed in a program while on top of that, spending half of their time in life skills, um, learning, you know, the soft skills that you would need. Um, and then what I call the hard skills, where you're going to actually learn a trade. Um, that's what Career X does for them. So my goal is to get all of my kids away from me at the end of their sophomore year. Because if that means that they're going on, they're moving on to the next step of, in their life. And so that's kind of where we're at with it. Um, Do you find that it's hard to get the kids into the Career X program because there's not enough spaces? No. Because we had to add a secondary classroom. We had to do a second set of children Did you? two years ago at the career center because we didn't have enough space. In. Really? So I've, I, in my experience with that, our kids, because they are so, because of the way they're identified mm -hmm. and because of how, how, what their needs are, Career X has no problem taking our kids. I feel like it would be like that for Cedarville as well, as opposed to Fairborn and Xenia, where they just get shuffled through. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot more kids in Beaver Creek that just kind of get overlooked. So that's really good to know. So if, if you're a student, uh, we have a lot of students at the high school that are on IEPs that they will try to steer them away from Pure X mm -hmm. and go into a regular program. And then for our kids, that's who Pure X is meant for. And so they're pretty selective in who they take. And when you have a resource classroom like we do, those kids basically, I think, get first dibs because they're the ones that need the most care mm -hmm. and opportunity. Well, they even do joint programs too. I mean, like the physical education component where they're doing um, the, the football coach is the teacher at the career center from Xenia. He teaches at the career center. Okay. They do a joint class with the career ex kids and teach them health skills and how to lift and how to work out and safe, safe ways to do things yep. so that they learn to take care of themselves and their bodies in day-to-day -day activities instead of just assuming that, you know, right. they're going to know how to do it. I mean, they work together and it's a goal of the program and it's a goal of Career X to work together. Yep. And there's a lot of that overlap. So the students in the regular labs are teaching the Career X students together and they're all benefiting from that. So do you know how long Searville High School's had their resource classroom? Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know. So that I mean that's definitely one of our goals. If I mean I, this is our second year. Do you mind if I please you kind of speak yeah, some of that? Please. Um, one of the things that I've seen and this was this was a, a passion of mine when I accepted this job at Greenview was to to try to build the opportunities that we're providing this population. And um what I, what I see the difference being now for us, especially with Trent being on, on board, um, there's students, all the students that you saw in that picture had the potential to be overlooked even in our high school. Mm -hmm. You know, we, like I said, it was the square peg round hole thing. You know, when we, were, when we were educating all the students, even a student with a specific learning disability and reading in the same classroom with a multiple disabled, you know, autistic student, mm -hmm. none of those kids were getting exactly what they needed. Um, so now that we can specialize and we can see those students as individuals, the students on that other end of the spectrum are getting support from teachers, qualified, certified teachers that can focus their energies on them. So those students are getting a level of support that is empowering them and, and raising that level of what they're doing and accomplishing that does make them, I think, very, very enticing candidates. The Career X students like come to our board yeah. meetings and speak to us about what they're working on. It's great. Yeah. <clears throat> they learn presentation skills. They learn how to go out into society, how to take care of themselves, how to take care of others. I mean, yeah. they are some of the most genuine and kind-hearted individuals we have ever seen at that school. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's and, tremendous. I mean, it, it, and it's a tremendous program. Mm -hmm. It really is. And it, but the, the thing that I see as the benefit to what we're doing now mm -hmm. is that Trent can advocate for these kids. That's great. You know, and we can see this from the beginning. We can start preparing them for a career X application in eighth grade. That's amazing. You know, when we, when before we were having these conversations in the middle of their 10th grade year, 
you know, do you want to go here? Are you interested in that? Do we think you're capable of that? You know, we were having all these conversations way too late. And so now that we can have a clear vision for, for what is the opportunity to look like, you know, what are the, the different pathways that you can go down? And we've already built that into place. We can lead them in that direction rather than try to follow them and push them where we want them to go. So sorry to step in no. on the space there, Mr. Olds, but please. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I mean, it takes a village with, the, with these students. Um, and, uh, you know, I saw Brenda here tonight who takes a really active approach with our kids too. So. Um, it takes a village. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on, our, the first thing we wanted to do when in this program when our students come in is we want to create a sense of community. Okay, and we do we need to do that by building strong relationships with them. And in order to do that, we have to invest and actually show interest and in their interests and in their strengths. And over the course of time, we identify their needs. Um, and we do that by having conversations with students themselves, um, the parents, and their previous teachers. Um, throughout the year, um, I would argue that Regina and I probably have more contact with parents than any other teacher in each building. I would argue that, that we do. Um, so we communicate with the families early on, and it's continuous throughout the year. Um, and we, we, if we, if we're, if we, as educators of a resource classroom are not inviting and welcoming parent feedback, then we don't need to be doing what we're doing. And so the parents have a huge say in what's going on with these students. Um, one of the things that I make a conscientious effort to do um, is collaborate with other teachers across all the disciplines to make sure that our program is inclusive and that we're aligning with curriculum standards. Um, I think that's important. Now I mentioned that academics is only a small portion of what we do, but the academics that we do do need to be valuable. And so um, communicating with other teachers across all the grade bands to make sure that what they're teaching, I am making sure that our kids are learning that as well. So the biggest thing in our classroom is routines. Well, if you step into our classroom, the very first thing you're gonna notice is that there's routines all throughout the day. But we also have to encourage flexibility. Um, young guy here on the spectrum um, has still getting used to our routines. Um, so we have to be flexible with it. Um, so what we do is we start each day with a check in. And all this does is give us a perspective about how that student's evening was, how their morning was, and it allows us to gauge their level of energy focus and readiness. Um, so we always go through a process in the morning a check-in process, and I won't go into the details, but um, it takes about half of our first period. Um, throughout the rest of the day, we divide our class periods into learning blocks. And so um, the way that I have our schedule set up now is Monday is math, Tuesday is English language arts, Wednesday is social studies, Thursday is science, Friday is vocational. And then we also trickle in math and English every day. The two main things that our students need to be able to do um, so that's how we and so we break the break it break it up into blocks throughout the day. So I don't typically follow the bell schedule. Um, Beth laughs at me all the time because the bell will ring and I have no idea where we're at in the day. <laughs> um, and, and and that's that's the God's honest truth. Well, we we just get going. We transfer when one thing ends. We transfer in the next with no regard for time. Um, and and that's not because I'm my time management skills are bad. It's just because we don't teach to the bells um, because it's not a traditional classroom. Our kids stay with us for the majority of the day. Um, and lastly, encouraging flexibility. With these students, you have to offer them choice. If you come down and you say, you're going to do this, you need to do that, that's not how they respond. Now, we're trying, now, there's one of the, that's one of the skills we work on as far as being career ready is being able to understand and, and take authority and respecting authority. But at this level where we're at, it's all about choice and differentiation, differentiation in learning. So in giving them, they're giving them opportunities to revisit and practice important content and working on certain skills daily, okay, within a certain subject. So if there's something that we teach early on in the day that a couple of students didn't grasp, 
Mrs. Arthur will pull those students over to her area, work with them to try to get them caught up so that we're not leaving any students behind. And by breaking our day up into learning blocks, it provides opportunities for Ms. Arthur to work with two or three students that maybe are our higher level students, where I'll take two or three other students that are our very, very low. And then Mrs. Bryant in the three periods that she's with us will take a mid group. And that's kind of how we differentiate that. And then they just kind of rotate. Um, so a lot of moving around going on. Um, with that, we try to vary our instructional approaches. The types of instructional approaches that you'll see in our classroom is direct instruction where I'm standing up in front of the room, leading a lesson, indirect instruction where the students will be leading the lesson, um, exper experiential learning where they are working with several different types of things to develop their own conclusions, independent study. We do that through a lot of web quests and making them learn how to research, provide information and come up with answers that they feel would best fit certain questions. And then obviously, making sure that it's interactive. And uh, <clears throat> we use that by using different technologies in the classroom. Um, we draw from these categories to ensure that there's variety in what we do in our activities in order to keep their interest and make sure that we have, and, and also hits and make sure that we're hitting all their varying degrees of abilities and their right, wide range of learning approaches. So, and we also keep in mind that we do have instructional goals that we have to reach. So everything is tailored towards me, meeting those instructional goals. Our learning environment, I'm blessed. Um, I've got a fully functional <laughs> kitchen. Last year, um, I was in a, I was in a about a 20 by 20 classroom. It was a little tight. We made it work. This year, um, love Terry to death. Glad she retired. I hope she's having a good time. Uh, I took her classroom, uh, which has been awesome for our kids. Um, we got a full functioning um, kitchen um, that we utilize every Friday. And God bless Beth. Without her, I don't know if we'd be able to do this. She's definitely a cooking expert in there. Um, but our kids love it. And, and it's an opportunity for them to do things that they wouldn't get to do in a general education classroom, which is what we're trying to do provide these students with opportunities that they wouldn't get in a normal classroom. And so this is a huge part of what we do. And unlike standard classrooms with a large number of um, students in a class, um, to our kids, 15 kids in class is a lot. Um, they are shy, they are quiet, they like small groups, it's, it's where they're comfortable. So if they walk into a classroom of 15 kids, that's a lot. We're fortunate to have a student teacher ratio of three to one. Um, which provides a positive and supportive environment. Um, and, it, and it's very, very good for academic, personal and social development, uh, which are areas that we work on with our students. <clears throat> Sorry, my nose started around. Um, designed to provide <laughs> struggling students. Yeah, our, uh, our classroom is designed to provide struggling students with an alternative setting to learn. Um, plain and simple. Um, and we do that through enhanced specialization, providing academic support and making and providing interventions um, where their needs can be met um, that they wouldn't be able to get in a general education classroom. So individualized instruction, that's the nice thing about what we do. We can support them in all academic areas with a focus on real world applications. Um, because of the low number of students in the high, or I should say low, student to teacher ratio, we can incorporate some type of uh, real world skills and essential skills into every lesson that we take because we're teaching to the kids. Um, we very rarely have to lecture to a whole group. Um, and so we're always ready to provide opportunities for behavior interventions, development of social skills and providing emotional support. Um, Big thing we did de developing executive function, um, executive functioning skills like time management, organization, and planning. Um, those things that they're going to need to be able to do to, in order to secure a job, and providing remedial instruction on topics that they wouldn't be that they were didn't quite grasp the first time. Um, last two slides we focus on life skills, which is those soft skills that students need, are, are learning self awareness balancing work and personal life stress and anger management attitude money management standards for dress. So preparing these students that there's more than just working hard you've got to act the part too. Um, and there's there's a certain way that you have to act in certain settings 
And that's what we're, and you've got to have some depth of knowledge of what requires you to be a good employee. And that's where we look at working on those soft skills. And then lastly, skills enhancement, um, working with them on making good decision-making, being problem solvers, um, being able to communicate wants and needs, struggles, um, learn how to multitask, or, and then standards for professionalism. Um, all those things that are important um, for these students to be able to take with them once they graduate and move on to the next phase of their educational process or workforce. So um, that's my presentation. Um, I hope you got a good idea of what our focus is in the classroom and what, um, what we're all about. So um, thanks for letting me speak to you. And, I hope you have a good rest of your night. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's yeah. very enlightening. I, do, I apologize. We we took so long, but okay. I mean, they, I am just thrilled about the work that these folks are doing. Um, and if I could, just to put a last little pin on this, you know, as you've seen these pictures, these are these are real kids in our community. And five years ago, prior to really starting this program, especially the kids that you've seen in this high school program they may not have been with us here in Jamestown at this time, right? These are kids that we would have had conversations about ESC programming for. We would be paying tuition for these kids to go to school in Bellbrook and Yellow Springs, elsewhere. And now they're here with us, where they should be. Their families are here, they're here, their community's here. We should be supporting them. And I know this is not a big piece of what Greenview does. This is not the kind of thing that you'll see on a report card or an ODE report or anything like that. But this is real impact into these families' lives. And I think it's some of the most important work that we're doing in this district. Um, I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud of these people. And these are two of the hardest working individuals that you'll ever meet. So thank you again for your time. If you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But I know you guys have other business to do. So <laughs> please, if you want to talk to me personally, I'm available anytime. So just thank you all so much. Thank, thank, you. Awesome. thank you guys. Yes. Yes. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you need. Brooke's going to handle that for me. All right, there we go. All right. <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Appreciate George, you. Thank you, Mrs. Mr. Olds, Mrs. Hein, Mrs. Arthur. We really appreciate you coming. I don't mean to take your yeah. items, but I'm going to go say good night to the boys before, uh, <laughs> before they go to bed. So, thank you all. I thank you, guys. Okay. Yes. Those are wonderful cute little boys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. At this time, um, Mrs. Fisher is going to present the five year forecast. Mine will definitely not be as interesting as that. <laughs> <laughs> um, bear with me. <laughs> um, each of you has a copy of the five-year forecast and the assumptions in your folder. Uh, once every, you know, once it's approved, I'll have Mrs. Ms. DeWitt posted on the website as well as the PowerPoint. So everything will be out there if you ever want to reference it, if anybody in the audience wants to reference it. Um, tonight, I'm just going to go through some main highlights as I usually do so that we can just point out the important things. <laughs> um, the forecast is required to be presented, as you know, that by the end of November, and then there is an update provided by the end of May. It is required um, by Ohio Revised Code, and it provides guidance to the Ohio Department of Education and Auditor of State to keep an eye on our finances. Um, we look at historical trends, what's happened in the district in the past, and then what's currently happening in um, the economy today. And the, the different variables that go into the forecast can often change, I will, as I will explain later tonight, um, on a dime. So what you're seeing tonight may not be what the situation is tomorrow. So um, we just want to find look at the financial trend of the district to make sure that the district is making sound financial decisions to sustain the district and to make sure that the, um, the that the kiddos are at the forefront of all our decisions. Um, this graph, you'll see three different lines. The line in red is the expenditure 
the district's general fund expenditures. I should I should have preferenced that. This forecast is only the general fund of the district. It's the one. It's our main fund in the district, so it doesn't take into account any type of debt or permanent improvement or any other type of funds. This is only the general fund. So the red line is the expenditures over the life of the forecast. The blue line are our revenues, and then the green line is the cash balance of the district. As you can see, the red line is always above the blue line, which means that the district is deficit spending. And that's gonna cause our cash balance to continue to go down. Um, the projections show a deficit fund balance of 1.4 million in fiscal year 27. No one is gonna be able to read this. <laughs> But I wanted you to be able to see what an actual forecast looks like. This is a summary of the different line items in the forecast, but there are so many, so much supporting documentation that goes into creating these individual numbers on the forecast. Um, in, further in the presentation, I will give you bigger snapshots of each section of the, the revenues, the expenditures, and the cash balance. So basically with the forecast, we're trying to determine does the district have a potential to incur a deficit in the first three years of the five-year forecast? I cannot certify to the state a forecast if there is a negative number in those first three projected years. Um, there are three main sections of the forecast as kind of explained earlier. There's revenues. <laughs> There's revenues and other financing sources, their expenditures and other financing uses, and then the cash balance. This gives you the next slide shows a snapshot of our revenues broken down by the different categories that the district has um, property taxes, income taxes, grants, um, and then other financing sources. This pie chart gives you an overview of all the different revenue categories in the general fund and what percentage of total revenues each category is. Um, you can see the state foundation amount, which is the amount we get for our school state funding, is 43.39% of our entire revenue. That's nearly 50%, which is um, a significant area of risk because um, our, sorry, lost my train of thought there. Um, the risk in, comes into our forecast in FY at fiscal year 24 and beyond because the new state funding formula was, was approved and it was approved for fiscal years 22 and 23 only. So depending on what happens with the next budget, they could decide to eliminate that funding or formula completely, they can decrease it or they may even increase it. So we really need to keep an eye on what happens with the next budget um, coming next year. When, do you know when we'll know? Um, it has, it's, they'll take it, the governor will present it um, February, March timeframe, and it'll go through the house, it'll go through the Senate, and then it'll go through all the different committees, but he's required to sign it by June 30th. Okay. So it's kind of a waiting game. So due to that fact, I just kept our um, state funding levels basically level for the entire life of the forecast. Our income tax collection was up 13.21% in FY fiscal year 22 over fiscal year 21. Uh, we projected an annual growth rate of 9.16% for fiscal year 23, but then we've kind of taken it back down to 2% in every year thereafter. So it's kind of, it's, it's, sorry, coming back up after pre-pandemic or after pandemic levels. Because property tax is also a huge amount of our revenue. Um, this slide shows our three different classifications of property, residential and agricultural, commercial and industrial, and um, public utility. Property tax revenue in whole uh, is approximately 27% 27% of revenue for the um, green view. A general reappraisal is mandated by Ohio law every six years by the county auditor, and then an update is required every three years. 
for Greene County fiscal or sorry, to, to calendar year 23 is an update year. Mm -hmm. So this is where the things can change on a dime thing <laughs> comes into. Originally in the May forecast, uh, we had projected a 3% increase in property tax values. When I was going through the forecast with our consultant, she felt that was extremely low. She'd been hearing um, rates from 15 to 20% increases across the state. So um, she, we, she also, her and I both felt that our values probably would not increase that much. So we put in a 6% increase for um, at fiscal year 24. But just yesterday, <laughs> I received an email from the county auditor and he feels that property taxes probably are going to go up, or sorry, sorry, revenue. <laughs> <laughs> property values are probably going to go up between 15 and 20% in the county. This is a huge deal for us. Um, I was not comfortable putting that in there. I <laughs> sat down with Sabrina, we went back and forth. So we set it on a 10% increase in um, our property values. This could be right, this could be low, this could be high. I don't really know, but I thought it was a good place to land. Yeah. You use that for which which years? Um, fiscal year 24. Okay. I would say that's, I think that's a good, yeah, number, good percentage. So. That's what I was comfortable yeah. with and it didn't make my heart palpitate as much. <laughs> um, he also did say that he thought that, um, Soil rates for CAV, CAUV property might go up between as much as 20 and 30%. Mm -hmm. So that also will come into play for us. Mm -hmm. um, what this did was um, it, in FY24, it puts the district at the 20 mil floor, which means that we will continue to get increases um, in our revenue from increases in property values. So um, I hope that things turn out that way, at least 10%. So we'll see what happens. Um, I did email um, the county auditor back and say, just to get an idea of when we might know. And he said that he hoped to meet with treasurer for March timeframe, but that we wouldn't have certified values till probably October or November of 23. So we're kind of just in a waiting game. Um, as far as unrestricted grants and aid, it, as I said, it's about 43% of our total revenue. I explained most of this already. Um, the new funding fair school funding plan incorporated four components um, that they identified as necessary to the education process. And I just wanted to note those here. Um, direct classroom instruction, building leadership and operations, instructional and student support, district leadership and accountability. Um, our, our current calculated base cost per pupil is approximately $7,315. Um, 4,000 of that is a local share and 3,000 is state share. This will change as our enrollments or wealth in the district changes. Um, as um, the funding formula also changed that it started to provide <laughs> funds directly to the district where the kiddos are educated as opposed to where they live. Currently, I'm just saying that because we don't know what's going to happen. Greenview is on the guarantee, which means that we are going to be, re we receive as much revenue as we were receiving in F20, F fiscal year 21. And it's gonna stay that way, of course, unless they change the budget and the funding formula again. Um, This is just a quick snapshot of the district enrollment comparison, um, enrollment versus the average daily membership. And you can see in FY23, there's a slight projected increase, which I think kind of is what OFCC is projecting as well. So um, it's based on the students enrolled in our district, plus the, the, um, the funding is based on the students that are enrolled in our district plus those that attend elsewhere through open enrollments, community schools, STEM schools, and the um, scholarship programs. So why are they projecting a higher enrollment number? Just because are there like a lot of younger like kiddos coming up? I think so, yeah. Okay. But I mean, it's just slight. You can just see it slight and yeah. goes down and goes back up. It's, mm -hmm. yeah, you never know. Okay. Yeah, you never know. 
So this next section um, is a snapshot of the district's expenditures broken again down by the different categories. Uh, we have personal services, which is your salaries, employee benefits, purchase services, supplies and materials, capital outlay, debt service, so forth. Um, this pie chart gives you a similar to what I did with the revenues. This is gives you a breakout between the different categories of the district's operating expenditures um, by category and what percentage each category is. Uh, salaries and benefits represent 73.88% of the district's total expenditures. It, which is in line with every other district in the state, but it's actually still less than the state average um, of 81.15. So we're in good shape there. Into the forecast, we built in the increases that we um, granted in both certified and classified negotiations. In, at the time of the May forecast, we'd only completed certified negotiations. We hadn't finalized classified. So this November forecast takes into account both of those negotiations. The benefits, <laughs> bless you. the benefits include the STRS and SERS, which is the retirement, health and dental insurance, workers' comp, unemployment, and Medicare. Um, STRS and SERS and Medicare are based on salary, so as the wages increase, those are going to increase as well. Some more good news that we received. Um, Greenview is part of the um, insurance EPC Insurance Consortium. And in May, they had told most districts to pre predict or project about a 10% increase in health insurance premiums. Well, when we got our rates back, we only had a 2% increase. So, so that was fabulous. Um, it was great news for us. I don't anticipate that we'll, we'll be that lucky again. <laughs> so for the remainder of, for FY23, we have the 2% in there, but for the remainder of the forecast, I did go back up to a 10% increase each year. What was that long ago? They were saying 16 and 17 uh -huh. when we did it a couple of years ago. It is. Uh -huh. We have a lot of yeah. healthy um, employees and their families. We'll yes. take it. Yes. That's exactly right. That's yeah. what I said. We'll take it. Um, this graph just shows that every category of our expenditures is increasing um, steadily across the um, forecast and it gives you a few years of history as well. So it's not just your salaries and benefits that are increasing. It's all your, it's your supplies, it's your purchase services, your fuel, of course, your um, heating and electricity, of course, as everybody knows in their personal lives, it's going up there, it's going up here. So um, this, this, this graph, shows the days of operating cash over the years of the forecast. The um, Government Finance, Finance Officers Association recommends that you have 60, at least 60 days of operating cash. And the district hits this mark around fiscal year 25, where we have approximately 69 days. So in order to stay at above this mark in fiscal year 26 and 27, um, as we have been discussing, the district needs to look at possible ways to generate revenue. This, what I wanted to do here, um, the top portion of the screen is the November forecast, and then the bottom portion of the screen is the May forecast. <coughs> so the circled items, you can see that that change in property values we had a negative um, balance in fiscal year 26 of almost 2.57 million. But with that change in property values, that becomes a positive 1, 1 million. So let's just keep our fingers crossed that it continues that way. So um, we are not going to have a, we are not projecting a negative balance now until fiscal year 27, whereas we were predicting it to start in fiscal year 26. So just to summarize kind of everything, income tax um, collection rate is increasing from the pandemic reductions. Our real estate values are steady and we just have to wait and see what happens in our update for 23. We have to keep an eye on the budget for 
24 and 25 and 20, um, 26, 27 to see how that affects how the state's gonna handle school funding. And then as, as we've noticed, expenditures still, expenditures still continue to trend higher than our revenues. So our cash balance is going to continue to decrease. And so what this means, um, we'd all but plan to put some type of levy on in May. So I think some discussions have to happen between the board and with our municipal advisors if maybe we can hold off a little bit on that. But again, it's, it's, it's just kind of going to depend on what happens tomorrow and in the future. But um, we're gonna reach out to a bunch of people to get some opinions on that and see where we can land. So and, your discussion with the aud auditor that happened post yeah, post Tuesday. Tuesday. I mean, yeah. it was just yesterday. So yesterday. I was gonna say, cause Tuesday was totally mm -hmm. different. Exactly. And tomorrow may be different. So, um, and so I kind of just wanted to say as my final note that this is only good as, to, as of today. Okay. <laughs> and um, the goal is to be realistic and I feel that we've done that. So um, it's impossible to predict it entirely accurately, but we do the best that we can, so. I get it. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Fisher. Right, yes, great job. At this time, we'll have the treasurer's report and <clears throat> approve the minutes of the regular board meeting October 20th, 2022. B, approve the October financial reports. C, approve October month in advances. D, approve donations as listed. Uh, Greenview Music Music Boosters to Greenview High School Drama Club, $35.63 to help with the cost of engraving a plaque for drama club members. And Mark and Ann Gordon to the Terry Pickering Scholarship, $75 donation. E, approved new student activity fund, giving club at the middle school. The giving club at the middle school, um, F, approve amended estimated receipts for October 2022. G, approve amended appropriations for October 2022. H, approve the five-year forecast as of November 30th, 2022. I, approve treasurer's report A through H as presented. Are there any questions on anything on the treasurer section? No. <laughs> I have a motion. I'll move. I'll second. Okay, Mr. Powers. Yeah. And Mrs. Reagan. Yes. Mrs. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Wallace. Yes. Miss, Mrs. Arthur. Yes. Motion passes. This time we'll have a superintendent's update, teaching and learning <coughs> facilities and operations. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> I apologize for my voice this evening. Um, I'll start with teaching and learning. Last week, um, our district leadership team met and three areas that we focused on first were our student outcomes, um, how our students continue to perform, and then to draw some conclusions and look across buildings um, to see where we might have some commonalities and patterns. Um, those vertical conversations are very healthy. Um, and we've identified that also we not only need to have them at the district level, but really at the grade levels and among classrooms as well. We also started talking about the systems you'll hear me talk about as we look at teaching and learning work, that really it's about how the system, how adult implementation pieces and student outcomes all work really in combination with one another to support student success. So we're really in a routine now, we're really in a groove with the DLT. Um, also at the last meeting, we started talking about goal three, the social emotional piece and, and how that has impact on students' readiness to learn. Um, Believe it or not, it's hard to believe. In fact, with the holidays approaching, that's hard to believe too, but when our winter benchmarking window is approaching. So we'll be assessing students again, our second kind of like um, dipstick check to see how students are performing with our benchmarking assessments. Um, I continue to work with Mrs. Leah Godlove, who is taking a teacher leadership role as a gifted intervention specialist in our district and really improving our gifted service model to make sure that it's addressing the specific needs of our students, that we are also looking at talent development opportunities and making sure that we have a, um, a continuum of service, much like our special, ed special education model, also for our gifted students. 
uh, I'm also meeting with um, Chris Perry, who's our new school psychologist, and really different from, I think, what happens um, and maybe even well intended in a traditional um, school psychologist role is to not to make sure that he's not just really working on testing kids, but um, through that inter interview process and having him on board, one of the things that was um, attractive to me was that he has strong knowledge and skill set and intervention and response to intervention and how to support students. So he is yet another leader among us that can support student um, not only their academic wellness, but also have social emotional ideas too for intervention. So whether he's working with teachers or working with administrators already um, is a huge asset to our district. Um, we're also starting to have beginning conversations about our science curriculum. It's time for us to especially update in grades four through 12. So um, one of our instructional coaches, Amy Adkins, is working with our science teachers on that. Two other areas that we're looking at uh, most intensely with core instruction are elementary math, as well as writing across the entire district. So those are kind of the curriculum pieces that are on our dashboard. As an aside, kind of somewhat related, um, though, I just wanted to give a shout out. We had our elementary program tonight um, at the elementary building, and I know that really going through the last two years, especially with COVID, has been difficult, especially for our elementary families that I know want to be involved and want to be engaged with students. So, you know, we're having programs again. Um, there's been a change in leadership of PTO at the elementary um, I know, so I know Mr. Hayes is working on that so our PTO can get back and more engaged and more involved again. And I also understand there might be some volunteer um, opportunities. So I did wanna give a nod to that as we're starting to get back to our old routines post COVID. Um, and also some celebrations are quarter one student celebrations. So at the middle school, they celebrate um, or they acknowledge students by month. In the month of September, um, the fourth grade, uh, the fourth grade student that they recognized was Madeline Mikesell. Fifth grade is Kenley Guess. Sixth grade, Bryson Lovin. Seventh grade, Reagan Montgomery. In October, fourth grade student to be recognized, Tucker Guess. Fifth grade, Dylan Caius, I might not have pronounced that correctly. Sixth grade, Jaden Thompson. Seventh grade, Brady Robinson. And students of the quarter at the high school. Eighth grade, Braylon Mikesell. Ninth grade, Addie Green. 10th grade, Campbell Newman. 11th grade, Sam Buford. And 12th grade, Emma Beck. On to the facilities portion, our bus garage project is still on schedule. All of the groundwork is done and we are still set on December 7th for the foundation to be poured and in the following week to have the unit set. Electrical and plumbing will follow and then we'll be looking um, to do the trenching work that will take place after everything is set. Um, we have replaced speakers at the football stadium here, a job that should have been done um, or is past due, I should say, so that job has been completed. We're also looking into, um, I understand that the middle school stadium speakers also need to be improved. We'll be sure to replace those and also look at our options for middle school and high school um, ball field softball and um, baseball. I would like to give a mention though, last year at the end of the year, we did replace the sound system at the high school gym. We also replaced the sound system in the middle school cafeteria and the middle school gym. So, um, really all of those areas needed attended to and um, we're taking them um, and addressing them as quickly as we can. Again, some I know if even overdue. Um, and we also were notified we're getting a new score table in the high school gym, but it is going to be delayed during to lead time changes. Something about the screen inside the table is not available. So unfortunately, I think we might be looking February before we get our new score table. They pour concrete in this cold of weather. Uh, what? There it might work. Uh, really? Yeah, I'd say the ground's still in. warm. Talking outside of my lane, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we're still the still under construction. They're doing everything you can possibly oh. imagine right now. <clears throat> Every day is a new pouring of something. <laughs> um, as sure. as, that's all right. No, good question. Uh, I don't. I, I I am thinking positively though, and I want to stick to our timeline, Mr. Powers. Um, SHP continues to work on the design phase of the uh, high school vestibule, which I think is really at its final stages. But also understand this is just the design phase. So then we'll have to make decisions regarding planning and the actual construction of that project. And I was told by the middle of November we'd hear about the uh, other safety grants. So I'm hopeful to hear from the state at any any time. 
Our second community advisory team meeting was held um, this week on Tuesday night, and we just sifted through and really prioritized the community values that we had started discussion about at the last meeting and further develop the conceptual facility plan options. I don't know how much narrowing we did, um, but there was really great conversation about what the options are about our property and also about some of the other additional pieces that we might be considering um, outside of using state funding. Um, and just as um, to kind of talking about OFCC and enrollment projections, there was actually, to our surprise, um, really the state's trend has been to, to present to districts enrollment that was actually going down. It really has been the trend for quite some time. So we were kind of surprised to see that the trends are starting to come up. So really actually quite pleased with the enrollment projections. And we have a meeting on Monday, a virtual meeting on Monday to talk about the projections. And now that we have enrollment, true enrollment numbers that have been approved to so start now assigning dollars to what that means. So back to kind of talking about all of the facility options. Now we'll start to be able to, like I said, attach some dollar amounts to that. So that will move the conversation along. Do they allow for any, how would you say, leeway if we are projecting with the Honda development a percentage of increase? prior to that that we can apply for? I do not believe so. So some of the conversation already, at least at the steering committee level, is that whatever we do and plan for needs to be flexible enough that there could be additions, if you will, or that you know, we put ourselves in, it makes me think about the middle school, we put ourselves in a position such that if we ever needed to add it to it, this is what it could look like. So I just think in terms of our planning and as we design and move through the process, we need to keep in mind just what that could look like if we right. had to add to or enlarge. Um, and then the other piece is also on Monday, I'm looking forward to meeting with someone from SHP, um, Inga and I are as well, to look at some um, voter analytics to start to understand how we might be able to um, strategize also as we look at you know, the potential, the master facilities um, and other ways in which we might need to generate revenue. Um, and just remember that our greenview.com is the link that anyone and everyone can stay updated on the community advisory team meetings, the CAP meetings, it's um, on our website. Uh, second quarter postcards should have been received. You have one here tonight, so. Um, just wanted to bring that to your attention. Another celebration on November 3rd. Um, Greenview was highlighted in the Dayton Daily News. We caught a pretty big spread there mm -hmm. of our football team and the community advisory team. And um, uh, we've got, I think this is the medical detectives class at the middle school and then the pink night here. So um, yeah, I was kind of happy about mm -hmm. all the the press literally we got there on on that page so wanted to share that with you um i attended the osba conference on monday and spent some time in, in sessions about design build and strategic planning and also um just about like the rules and regulations from bricker and eckler on levy work etc so it was it was good to um be able while we're going through some of those pieces attend some sessions that were helpful to me the auditors are in this week, so this is Inga's big week with a five-year forecast and the auditors in the office, so um, hopefully they finish up on Friday. Um, uh, unfortunately, I have to report that um, it looks like that we're going to have an open board vacancy and that has been, that has been posted, the application for a seat has been posted to our website. Um, I know that there are probably additional questions associated with that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share that with the board here. Uh, with the open vacancy, the seat is actually going to be appointed. Um, right now, the draft of the, the plan is that, that we would conduct interviews based on those applications at the regular uh, executive session at the regular board meeting on December 15th. Um, the actual appointment of the new position we are hopeful to have at the January 12th organizational meeting. Um, and then that appointment would last technically um, through that year, January 1, 2024. Yeah. So if the individual who is appointed wanted to maintain the board position, then they would have to run in the special election in November of 23, if you're following me. And then that individual 
once they won the special election then would serve the remainder of Angela's term, which is an additional two years, concluding on December 31st, 2025, if I have all of my years right. So is. there are a lot of questions I understand probably with how this process is going to look. Run again. They would run again when you right. Teresa would run again. Why are you, you putting and I run so? in 23? I mean, wouldn't, weren't we supposed to? You just have one year, no. right? We're, we're just on our first she, year. Yeah, she's on her first year. Yeah, so, so, she, um, so, so Sabrina has Teresa her and I are on the right. same. So I think she, I, I, yeah, I, I do. Yeah. Position will revert to your. Because I, I would have to rerun again next summer. With it's same you as you and I rerun next year, but they yeah. would only run next year for that two year term, and then they would be still on back the on same the rotation schedule. again. They'd be back with you two, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then just for also inquiring minds, that a board member serve a four year term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but dang, you're retired, you're re resonating, resigning awfully early here. Resonating. Are you leaving it? Are you skipping town <laughs> yeah. like now? <laughs> no. Not quite yet, but All right. enough. <laughs> um, just mm -hmm. a few more things. Make sure to check out our community events and opportunities, which is a new section of our website um, that is online where you can see where um, you can participate in community events throughout the um, community. Um, not just school events, but other community events. We've also made a concerted effort to post more celebrations and information on our Facebook page um, to making sure that we can, you know, share all of our celebrations and um, make sure that we're telling our story. And just <clears throat> lastly, please, <clears throat> a belated happy Veterans Day to all those brave men and women who served and continue to serve in the armed forces. Um, our school activities were a huge success and very well attended, which they always are. But it was it was really great. It was really great to see all of our veterans in the district last week. I can close my superintendent's update. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Woodruff. We'll move on to new business. A, <clears throat> approve the farm lease agreement at 4710 Cottonville Road for seven acres from November 1st, 2022 to December 21st, 2025. B, approve the following students for payment in lieu of transportation for the 22-23 school year. Josh Smith, Lena Smith, and Micah Smith. C, approve di district's compliance with nutrition standards. And D, approve the new business items A through C as, a print, as presented. Do I have a motion? I'll move. Second. Okay, Mrs. Reagan. Yes. Mrs. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Wallace. Yes. Mrs. Arthur. Yes. Mr. Powers. Yeah. Motion passes. And now personnel. A. Approve Jason Neri, high school evening custodians, that five one year contract for the 2023 22 23 school year, contingent upon proper certification, background check, and completion of required paperwork. B, approve the resignation of Angela Reagan, Greenview Local School District board member, effective December 31st, 2022. C, accept the resignation of Bonnie Hildebrandt, elementary school clerk, effective November 19th, 2022. D, accept the resignation of Matthew Slater, high school custodian, effective November 4th, 2022. E, rescind the quick recall contract for Mr. Rowland and approve Stacia Ford as assistant advisor. F, approve the following supplemental coaches for the 2022-23 school year. Assistant Bowling, Regina Heim, teaching license. G, approve the following classified substitutes for the 2022-23 school year, Tammy Crum, custodian. H, approve personal items A through G as presented. Move. I'll second. Thank you. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Wallace? Yes. Mrs. Arthur? Yes. Mr. Powers? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Was that a yes? Yes. Mrs. Reagan. I'm staying. <laughs> <laughs> <Very fantastic. clears throat> All right. At this point, um, we are at seven discussion, no discussion at this point. Uh, comments and questions for non agenda items. Do we have any comments or questions? 
If not, Florida, that's the answer. Go ahead, ask. <laughs> Just <kidding. laughs> we are where there's no snow. <laughs> if not, we are going to no. um, <clears throat> move into executive okay, session. Can I have a motion to enter into executive we'll session? A second. Eight twenty-four, and there will be no business after the executive session. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Yeah. Mrs. Reagan. Yes. Mrs. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Mrs. Wallace. Yes. Mrs. Arthur. Yes. Passes. All right.